Uh, we're going to look at several scriptures this morning, but the first ones we're going to look at, you probably all know by heart. So I want to talk about our orders, okay? What are our orders? What are the orders given to the local church? And you know, Brother Taylor, that one of those orders is to, to preach. The Bible says in Luke 24, uh, starting down there about verse 46, I believe that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name. So, so what is preaching? Preaching is expounding or explaining something and urging people to comply with it. You notice he didn't say preach the church, though I think the local church is, is one of the most important things in Scripture. He said preach repentance and remission of sin. Repentance is a change of mind that brings about a change of direction. But now, Brother Ernie, how am I supposed to preach? Well, let's go in our minds to Matthew 28. I'm going to meet you in Psalm 85 if you want to be turning there. But let's go in our minds to Matthew 28. If I were to ask you to quote the Great Commission, most of you would start with verse 19. Verse 19 is, Go ye therefore. But there, the, the words in red, if you will, when Christ actually began to speak are in verse 18. And he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Verse 19, go ye therefore. That word power is the same word translated power in Romans 13. And it's talking about jurisdiction. It's talking about authority. So I don't go for it. I'm glad my daddy raised me in church, amen. I'm glad my, my, my parents took me to church. Kevin, I tell people playfully all the time, I was raised on drugs because I was drugged to church Sunday morning, drugged to church Sunday night, and drugged to church Wednesday night. And if we had baseball and the church had revival, they had baseball and I went to revival. That's the way I was raised. But that's not a good enough reason to preach. We preach on his authority, on his power. So we're supposed to preach. By the way, that includes you, Brother Baby. We're supposed to preach on his power. Not what John said. Not even what Brother Al said. But what did Jesus say? How are we supposed to preach? On his power, his authority. In his passion. The Bible says in John 20, 21, As the Father sent me, so send I you. Now there's some people in this room. From Brother Jimmy to Brother Ernie to Byron to... The Harris family that I've known for a while. But I don't see anybody in here that can take two sardines and five biscuits and feed New Hope. So I don't think that he means to do everything he did. I, I really don't see anybody that can walk on water. Okay? I don't see anybody that can go to it. Where's Brother Jerry Tilly going right now? To a funeral. I don't believe that fella in the casket's going to get up today when Brother Jerry shows up. Be nice, but I don't believe it's going to happen. So what does he mean when he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you? Well, I wouldn't argue with you if you disagree with me. But the Bible says over there, I believe it's in Matthew chapter 9, that he was moved with compassion when he saw the people as sheep having no shepherd. Brother Dean, sheep are stupid. You can get yourself some sheep, and if they're not accustomed to your presence every day, they could be dying of starvation, and you might dump some food out and walk away, and they'll eat it, but they're never going to take it while you're standing there by it because they don't know you, and they don't trust you. And our world has changed. That's really the way the world looks at us. They don't know us, and they don't trust us. And we get mad about all this stuff, and sometimes it's righteous indignation, and it's okay. And sometimes it's selfishness, because they don't do what we want them to do. Compassion is not just love. The word passion is love. There's a young lady right here, Homer always asks me if it's my daughter in the black sweater and the yellow shirt underneath it or gold. Yeah, I'm, I'm colorblind, she says, but it's bright right there. I love her passionately. We've been married nearly 22 years. I hope we make it to 70 years. I'll be 100 years old, amen, but I hope we make it that long. That's not the same. Compassion is empathy. To feel with them. 
So we go in his, on his power, his authority, in his passion, his compassion, his love for people. And then Acts 1 has the word power. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, some people say, well, you know you have that power if you do this or if you do that. I'm going to tell you how you know you have that power. And that's if your life is consumed with telling people about Jesus Christ. That's the proof that you're full of that power. And that word power is the same word power translated in Romans chapter 1. Just like in English, we use words differently. In the Greek, they use the words differently. That word power there is, is where we get our word dynamite from. If you read, Brother Ernie, in the New Testament, when the church was being the church, the world was afraid. Because when those people came around, lives changed. Bars closed. Things were different. Idol worshiping houses were shut down. Not by force, not by human force, but by Holy Spirit force. We got to have that power. To whom are we to preach? Well, Mark said every creature. Now, that doesn't mean I need to go out here and preach to the dogs. And I know y'all got one named Red that Julie feeds. But we don't have to go preach to little Red out here in the parking lot. To whom do we preach? Every creature. That's those people that we don't really understand how they think. Matthew says every nation. Now, growing up in Mississippi, I thought, well, I actually thought Chicago was another country when I was a boy. But anyway, it probably is today, amen. Uh, I thought we were talking about the United States and Canada and Mexico. and But it's talking about every people group. Did you know there are people groups that have moved to Columbus that have no gospel witness? Because you don't speak their language. But it's our job. To give them a gospel witness. Every person. Of every people. And most of the recordings of the Great Commission. Talk about a place. Beginning at Jerusalem. That's right here. Judea. That's like Mississippi. Samaria. That's those parts of Mississippi that you don't like. To the uttermost part of the world. Those are our orders. How are we going to combine? How, how are we going to fulfill those orders? Because honestly, I'm looking at people I know are trying to do that. Maybe not everybody, but there's at least a portion within the room who's trying to do that. But there, there's, there, there's this key failure, I think, and, and maybe not on your part. The Holy Spirit will tell you if it's you. But I know it's a problem looking across our land. Statistics bore me, but I still read them. And statistics are that the average pastor spends less than 10 minutes a day in prayer. So I'm not thinking the people are spending too much time in prayer. It's the pastors aren't spending too much time in prayer. And all that power in, in Acts chapter 2, you know, Peter stood up and prayed. There's, there's a couple of different reasons. Number one, everybody in the church was in the street witnessing. Not just the preacher. Not just the preacher and his son. Not just the preacher and the deacon. But as the kids say today, everybody was in the street witnessing. But even more important than everybody participating, they spent 10 days. See, the word Pentecost, they got denominations now named Pentecost. That, that word just means 50 days. 50 days from the Passover, they had a celebration. Christ was crucified at the Passover. 50 days later, they have a celebration. The Bible te tells us that he was that he walked around on the earth 40 days before he ascended. So then that 10 days between the ascension and Pentecost, they were in one accord. I should walk to the piano and hit it, but you understand. Bum, bum, bum. One accord. Not, you also understand if I hit white keys and black keys that are close together, it sounds like stepping on a cat's tail. That's some of the music we're making. I, I, I believe that this church has been insulated from some of that. 
But nationally speaking, a lot of churches sound like stepping on a cat's tail. They have one accord because they spent that time in prayer together. You see, if Brother Taylor's listening to the Lord, and Kevin's listening to the Lord, and Brother Jimmy's listening to the Lord, and Byron's listening to the Lord, and Dean and Shiloh are listening to the Lord, and if I could remember everybody's name and go around the room, if we're all listening to the Lord, then there can't be an argument amongst us because Christ is not contrary to Christ. And I believe all of that is, is those are our orders to be in one accord, to preach in his power, his authority, his passion, his love, his power, his strength to every person of every people in every place. But let's look at the observation for just a second. Statistics show that 98% of us who claim to believe the Bible will not talk to somebody who doesn't claim to believe the Bible. There's, there's two people that used to go to this church. And since this is recorded, I'm not going to say their name out loud. But I told them yesterday, I expected to see them here. You know where it's at, but the address is 100 Victory Loop. I expect to see you there at 11 o'clock. They're not here. We beat ourselves to death, Dale, trying to get those people that know a little bit and won't follow through with what they know. But statistics show we won't go talk to the drug dealer. We won't go talk to the Muslim. We won't go talk to the good guy who works 60 hours a week to pay his bills and give his kids a nice phone and a nice car and all that, but won't get right with God. We won't go talk to them. But we'll beat ourselves to death with somebody who already knows what they ought to do. Some of our logic we get from Scripture. I told you I was going to meet you in, in, in Psalm 85, and I promise I'm going to go there in just a second. But y'all all can probably quote the scripture, come out from among them. Be ye separate. And be ye separate, touch not the unclean thing, right? And so a lot of times we as Christians, we use that. Here's, here's a problem that I see. We're talking about observation here. What do we see? Why are churches not growing? Why are we not seeing people saved like, like we used to? And Lee Robinson, he's dead and gone now, but he said the Savior hasn't changed and sinners haven't changed. It is the saints who have changed if we're not seeing people saved. That's good preaching, but hard living right there. Because it's hard to look in the mirror and see that you might be the problem. I might be the problem. Paul said in, in Acts 5, 27 that he, I can't quote it exactly, and I don't want to take the time to look it up, but basically he said he did not fail to preach all the counsel of God. And one of the greatest problems I see, whether we're talking about some, some group of Baptists or whether we're talking about I interact with people from any Christian denomination, okay? I don't necessarily work with people from any, any Christian denomination if we don't agree on some pretty central things there, but... But I talk to them. I try to encourage them in the Lord. And what I see is this thing that goes across is we all have committed to memory a certain portion of the scripture that makes us feel good about ourselves. But we have not committed the whole counsel of God or all the counsel of God as the Bible says in Acts 20. So it's true, the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. But listen to what the same human author, we know God is the author of it all, right? The same human author says in 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one know not to eat. He just said that I have to be able to talk to the people that are in sin. We're going to come back to that in a minute. 
the salt and the water got to touch the meat. I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. We're still talking about the observation. But we want to come out and be separate. But sometimes we have separated ourselves so far that we don't talk to sinners. We cannot preach the gospel to them if we don't talk to them. Look at Psalm 85, 6. I told you to meet me there. Psalm 85, 6. I have it underlined. I bet, I bet you probably do too if you are accustomed to writing in your Bible. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? We sing this song, revive us again, right? Every time we have a revival, we sing that song. Sometimes we sing it throughout the year. If the Lord has revived, uh, if we want the Lord to revive us again, y'all are awfully quiet this morning. So I'm going to ask you some questions and try to get you talking to me. Amen. If we want the Lord to revive us again, what does that mean he has done before? He's revived us before. So we looked at our orders. We looked at our observation. Let's think about an oral history of revival, which I cannot give you a complete one. But if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4, the, the greater part of Genesis chapter 4, Dale, is talking all about the world, basically. The lost people. It's talking about uh, Cain's family and how wicked and perverse they were. But one of the last, I think it's the last verse in the chapter said, Seth had a son whose name was Enos. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that's your first revival. Hmm. If you, if you look forward from there, we can go to Ezra and Nehemiah. Nehemiah was right with God. But Nehemiah wept and prayed and, and confessed national sins to God and begged God to send him back to Jerusalem. And God worked it out that a pagan lost king not only let him go, but paid his way. Ezra. Ezra was the preacher. Nehemiah built the wall. Ezra built the temple. The Bible says of Ezra that he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. Not just to seek it, but it says, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Those are kind of our orders, right? You got to seek the Bible. You got to know the Bible. You got to do the Bible. And you got to teach the Bible. That was a revival. Hmm. You go forward to Josiah. If we looked around, I know it's not true at this church, but if we looked around at churches we see on TV and, and churches we know of in Columbus, Mississippi, they have lost the word of God in the house of God. And that's what Hilkiah said to Shaphan the scribe. Go tell the king, I have found the book. Kevin, they lost the, God's word in the house of God. And when they read it to him, he ripped his clothes. He began to pray and fast. And a revival came out of that. Hmm. We could talk about Samaria in Acts chapter 8. We could talk about John Bunyan in the 1600s. We could talk about Whitfield and Wesley in the 1700s. Whitfield was so godly. But a man named Randall from your church history got saved when he heard Whitfield died because he said if he died, God must be coming back. And he knelt down right there when he got the news and called on Christ. Amen. That's the kind of life I want to live. And when I die, people think, boy, it's been to be over. We got to get right. He's done it before. We can talk about Jeremiah Lamphere from the 1800s. He wasn't even a preacher, Ernie. He was a retired salesman. And an old dead, dying church said, we'll pay you to knock doors in our community because our church is dying. Hey, I'm Jeremiah Lamphere. I'm from such and such a church. And after weeks and weeks and weeks, he wasn't seeing anything happen. He said, we got to pray. The first day, he started a prayer meeting at lunch. And this is in New York City, Keith. New York City. 
first day, we're going to commit an hour to prayer. One or two other people showed up when the hour was almost over. Said he'll just quit. He didn't. And within a few months, 10,000 businesses were closing for an hour at lunch in New York City for prayer. Now you can think what you want to, but I think that's why the North won the war. Because they were praying. <laughs> you know, towards the end of his ministry, it's when a man named Billy Sunday got saved. Billy Sunday and D.L. Moody preached. D.L. Moody died around 1900. Billy Sunday carried it on over there to the 1930s. <coughs> World War II kind of brought its own revival. But we really hadn't had one since. Maybe a little bit of one around 1970. Hadn't had one since. So what's the operation? What are we going to do? All right. Flip a few pages forward in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. I promise I'm coming in for a landing. Y'all are awful quiet this morning. I pray that you're tuned in and the Lord's working in your hearts. But in Proverbs chapter 4, I think we will see a, a very important truth. Towards the end of the chapter, verse number 23, you may even have it underlined in your Bible if you're accustomed to that. I believe it was Solomon, but whoever the author of Proverbs, this particular proverb was, wrote, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You see, we don't pray like we should, and the problem starts in here. We don't witness like we should. That problem is here. A lot, of, a lot of times we study the Bible in order to prove that we are right. That is a heart problem. We don't study the Bible to prove that we are right. We study the Bible so that God can use us to reach people, so that we can draw closer to God. Somebody has said that when you pray, you talk to God, and when you read your Bible, he talks to you. I'm going to say that's one of the ways he talks to you. Now, he's not going to give you a word that contradicts the Bible, but I believe he is still speaking to your heart in that still, small voice. Okay, if you disagree with me, I, I just don't know how to answer that other than scripture. But I believe it's just like Paul saw, you know, he, he had that vision. I, I don't necessarily believe he's going to give you a dream today, Keith, what he's going to do tomorrow. But I believe that still small voice will say, give that man a track. That still small voice will say, invite that lady to church. That still small voice will tell you what to say to whom and when and how. <coughs> Keep your heart. So I'm not reading my Bible. I'm not listening to God. I'm not even listening to that still small voice. What is our operation? Well, first we've got to keep our heart. I think just one more little problem that I think hurts me and hurts every Christian I know is we want the world to change. And we want to start with the world. <coughs> We want the world to change, and we want to start with the world. But even if you go to the Great Commission, it starts with God and then us. It's his power, his passion, his power, his authority, his love, his strength. But we can't do any of that right until we've, we're prayed up, if you will. You agree with that? Say amen. 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 All right. Can't do any of that right. So right now we want the, I mean, we, we're, we're not even, I ain't even said the word impeachment, right? I ain't even talked about all the mess you see in the news every day, right, Brother Shepard? I hadn't mentioned any of that. But still in our minds, we want the world to change. And so we have conversations amongst ourselves as to how the world needs to change. But that is not the recipe for revival. The recipe revival for revivals, whether we're talking New Testament or Old Testament, Starts with us. You go to the New Testament. It says, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. How long have you been married, homie? Uh-oh. He had to look over at his wife. 50 years. 50? The first 50 All right. You got a little Honda Accord now, don't you? All right. So... You know, I grew up, four of us in the front of a regular cab truck, right? And you think of, and I bet there's a bunch of people that grew up 
at least you, you've seen somebody. And when you're dating in a regular cab truck, the bench seats they had back then anyway, you're driving and she's sitting right there, right? And then you get married and Junior comes along and, and a little girl comes along and they're between you. And so mama goes over there and daddy's still driving. Now you think about this in your spiritual life. You've been married 50 years. Let's just say Shiloh's grown, got kids that nearly grown, maybe are grown. So let's say a few years ago, maybe 20 years ago when, how long are you, Dean, y'all been married 20? Been to be 24, all right. So let's say 24 years ago, she gets married. Mom's still over there. Mom starts crying on the way to town one day. Men, you know it's true. I'm gonna probably get shot for this, but you know, a lot of times they don't tell us they're upset until it's just eating them up. <laughs> she starts crying on the way to town. We just don't sit close anymore. Now of all the people in the church, you can hear Homer Beatty say, I hadn't moved. <laughs> That's what God's saying to you right now. I hadn't moved. When you gonna draw nigh again? Hmm? Think of Second Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. We want to start with heal their land. But that's not God's recipe. Now, I don't know how well y'all tuned in. You look like you're real tuned in. You're just awful quiet. But I got goosebumps thinking about God's recipe. Now, I know there's a lot of hunters in the room. 243 is a good rifle. If you, you put that in your head, you'll remember this verse the rest of your life. Two, my people, my name. You see, revival starts with us. Humble. No place for arrogance in God's program. No place for arrogance in God's program. But to pray. Seek my face. Here comes the hard part because none of us want to admit this. Turn from our wicked way. Did you know it's downright wickedness if I've got Jesus Christ living in my heart and I fail to ask that person at the gas station to come to church? I fail to interrupt those people? Look, I got to hurry along. Listen to this. I know he killed hogs as a boy. If you killed hogs on a farm as a boy, raise your hand. One third of the crowd, so the rest of y'all are going to get a lesson. All right? <laughs> In, in, in Matthew, the Bible says, ye are the salt of the earth, and lest the salt have lost his savor, wherewith it's good for nothing to be cast out and trodden underfoot. His savor. In Ephesians, the Lord says, talking about husbands loving wives, as Christ loved the church, and he talks about that he washes her with the water of the word that he can present her to himself spotless okay so a lot of us want to run around and we want to present our lives to people right shadrach meshach lockridge said there's five gospels matthew mark luke john and your life and most people are not going to read the first four so a lot of us want to run around with what, what used to be called, they tell me it's an antiquated term, Brother Taylor, but they used to call it lifestyle evangelism. I just live right, and they're going to ask me how to be saved. It's never happened to me. And then some of us, we want to go tell everybody how to be saved, but our lives don't back it up. If we're going to reach them, the salt and the water have to touch the meat. they got to see your changed life. And they got to hear the word of God. When you killed those hogs, man, I'd love to tell you the whole story how it's done. But let's talk about how they preserved the meat. There's two ways they preserved the meat. My papa smoked it. I had, had aspirations of building a smokehouse like he had when I was younger. And, and I got my uncle to describe it to me. And it was a little short, squatty building. And he built a little green fire that would just smoke. And he, I said, well, how long did he smoke it? He said, till the meat quit dripping. That's how long he smoked it. And it was good all year. And he had a salt box in there. So he used salt 
and smoke. Well, the other way is to use salt and water. So if you use salt and water, you got to first, for the water, you have to put copious amounts of salt in the water and boil it so it'll mix up in there, right? So it'll dissolve in there. You take a barrel and you seal the barrel. This is before plastic, right? So you have to take some beeswax or something and seal the cracks in the barrel. You, you put an inch or so of salt in the bottom there and you lay the meat in there. And then you put, you gotta be sure the meat doesn't touch one another, it'll spoil. Be sure the meat doesn't touch the sides, it'll spoil. The meat has to be completely surrounded by salt. And you layer it, salt, meat, salt, meat, salt, meat, salt, meat, salt, meat, till you get to the top. Then it's full, right? No. Then you take that water that you've cooled off now, and you gotta make sure it, you gotta make sure that it's enough salt in there, so you put an egg in it. If the egg floats, you got enough salt in the water. If the egg doesn't float, you gotta put the fire back under it, put some more salt in it. You take that salt water and you pour it in there until the meat is covered, and then you have a lid and a weight that you put on it to hold the lid down against the salt so that it stays covered and the meat is protected. That's what we, another one, when we talk about the salt and the water's got to touch the meat, we can't win them, Keith, if we're not rubbing shoulders with them. Now, I'm not talking about going down to whatever bar is open in Columbus today and hanging out with them, but if we don't talk to them regularly, how are we going to win them? If you don't bump shoulders with somebody that's lost, how are you going to win them? Now, you expect me to go to bomb holder if the Lord opens that door and win people to Christ, and I love you. And I have loved most people in this room most of my life. But God expects the same thing of you right here in Columbus. We want him to heal our land. Chris and I talked about before church how close we are to a civil war in this country. Because there's such animosity. The only solution to that civil war is us getting right with God and affecting the world around us. I'm going to shut up now. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of preaching here this morning. I pray that you take this 